so shashank like in the meantime uh, would you mind explaining like what uh, our attendees can expect for uh, today's session on your part so that uh, we can have questions around that in the meantime uh, he joins yeah yeah so briefly i mean uh, what i would be speaking on is yeah, like you know like we sp- uh, spoke about the topic last time about uh, you know how retail investors can basically maximize their portfolio returns through through investing and through concentration and how to like you know manage risk in that particular strategy how to manage risk how to manage allocation how to think basically that on a portfolio level how your portfolio grows and how you can actually reach financial independence so so those will be some areas and we can also you know field some questions around like you know how to like you know how to build conviction on stocks so yeah that would be on my side friends uh, are you there yeah 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 shashank yeah. so that that's was like so, pretty much yeah great great so guys uh, we'll be starting in uh, a couple of minutes and in the meantime if you have any questions uh, around uh, the topic for today so we'll be discussing it sector and uh, as very rightly explained by shashank so how how retail investor can be at uh, an edge over institutions so we'll be discussing those so we have amia with us yeah yeah and amia i think we would he would take on the on the uh, it part he's a expert on that and yeah i mean would we'll, would we'll love to hear his views on that and everything hello may i yes am i audible am i audible okay yeah yeah loud and clear so welcome oh, again okay hey okay. thanks for us so great to have you again you and sushank so so guys uh, we have uh, amaya and sushank with us as uh, we discussed earlier also so the section uh, the topic of discussion would be overview of uh, it sector what what amaya think about uh, the it sector and that could be a starting point for you guys and again uh, sushank will be talking about how retail investor can grow his port- portfolio many times just by uh, working on his greed and uh, making a strategy welcome to both of you guys any any opening note on your part amay and shashank well uh, nothing nothing specific in my front like you know as i mentioned i would be touching more on the you know the strategy part the you know so strategy psychology how to think about it how to scan on like you know stocks and uh, yeah amay do you want to add something yeah, are we audible to you uh, maybe you are on mute amay Uh, some issue so uh, in the want of uh, time shashank uh, why can't you go ahead and like uh, briefly explain uh, what we would be discussing i mean yeah how we can be at advantage yeah. uh, what's your strategy how how we can go about it yeah so yeah i mean like you know last time we had a discussion around uh, you know like uh, this like you know the, the right approach towards investing when it comes to you know uh, portfolio management and everything so i can just briefly summarize what we discussed last time and then we can actually you know take case by case and uh, you know specific details so what i what i personally do in my portfolio is i i run a concentrated portfolio and uh, my strategy for scanning is uh, more like you know a blend of fundamentals technicals and momentum so i basically go for only for stocks that are showing all these three traits and then i bet heavily on those and uh, uh, with that i think uh, two th- important things that one needs to take care of is your uh, you know your greed management so i don't look for let's say if i have put like more than 50% of my portfolio in a particular stock i don't sit with a with an expectation that it has to double or it has to, it has to go two three times four times 20 times or whatever so i uh, you know do i what i do is i generally have a a threshold limit of 12% uh per stock so so just just to give you an idea why 12% so last time when we spoke i shared that you know if a person has to grow his portfolio 100 times uh from a starting point he just needs basically 50 trades 50 trades with an average gain of 12% and this takes care of your you know transaction costs and short term uh, trans- uh, short term taxes of 15% so you just need 12% and you know 50 trades to grow your portfolio 100x so this is why i keep this figure of 12% now a stock can double and stock can triple and can go anywhere 
but my threshold is like am I like for example let's say stock moves 12% right so i would like you know like move my trailing stop to that and then i take that particular position in which i am as a second trade so i i keep trailing that way until you know the portfolio grows and i and i exit on uh, on the risk management side i have a you know strict strict stops at 8% so that's how i manage the you know capital loss since you know strategy is concentrated investing so you got to take care of that and uh, one important thing is i do not mind getting back into stocks where i have stopped in so i mean if the stock is moving up and there are you know earnings triggers and everything and i have like like i was wrongly pushed out of it due to whatever reasons i don't mind you know coming back into the stock again and yeah so that that's how that's how briefly i can summarize that that's that's what i do on on my portfolio all right so shankar will come to you with more questions so in between so amia how how you see the it space last business like so can if i put a straight question do you see like uh, this is more of accumulation phase for the it sector as a whole hey prince i hope my yeah, yeah. audible this loud and clear uh okay it again <laughs> so we have uh, we have discussed about the sector in depth and breadth in so many different spaces and sessions right so to be very honest with you uh, um, i mean at least the subject wise there is nothing much to talk about but you know if you are following the sector up closely there are some changes which are really underway for example if you listen to certain con calls back in 2021 uh and most of the management said that you know the kind of fundamental change that the, the hyperscaler adoption has brought is industry is witnessing large number of smaller deals right the deals that can be executed in a very short amount of time but uh that was just a year ago and now if you listen to the con call for example from uh, any of the top big companies or even accenture and you would see that the customers are back you know focusing on the large transformation deals multi billion dollar large transformation deals so the situation is very fluid to be very honest with you okay but that said uh, julie sweet actually mentioned in you know her her con call that regardless of what's going on and the macro and the spending concerns that you know the digital analysts have customers you know given the kind of macro changes and the macro headwinds that are happening that's going to you know help the technology companies in a certain way it's not that the technology spend will suddenly go out of the fashion but the thing is if you have macro headwinds that clearly means in order to win or in order to stay ahead you have to stay closer to your customers you have to listen to your clients in real time so that means the the companies they also need to change more not less right this is exactly what her line was so to be very honest with you i don't know whether this is an accumulation or, or distribution or what it is to be very honest with you i talk about the subject uh, i talk about the technology i talk about the underlying changes that are happening for example if you see right now you know there was this uh, very good article that came up on on the ken uh, so all these big hyperscalers are now you know opening their own data centers in india so how that affects the indian it companies that's the first question anybody should have and that means you know all for example all these hyperscalers come at a cost and if you have let's say for example one of the dc to which where your workload is currently getting executed on and if that dc is located somewhere in the europe the cost to run that particular workload is going to be very huge because the prices of the energy have shot up right so the reason all these hyperscalers are opening you know very huge capacity data centers in india so that is basically to bring the cost of you know shifting workloads to the cloud down and they anticipate in the next 3 to 4 years the cost of adoption or the cost of running a payload 
on a data center located in India will fall by 50% from what it, what it is at the moment. So that's a huge, huge cut, right? So if we have to keep watch on all these aspects and how, how that impacts Indian IT companies. So first thing is whoever kind of built the you know relationships with these hyperscalers like four or five years ago and have you know are at the pinnacle of the affiliation level they will start seeing consistent inflow of the customer contracts from these hyperscaler domestic customer contracts actually that's how i'm at the moment anticipating it it would definitely have negative impact on the on the domestic data center company no doubt about that uh, but that is one change that is happening also if you see you know uh, hcl tech infosys tech mahindra they are doing and even i'm just taking these uh, companies name to give you an example in no way it's a recommendation but these companies are doing some really good work in the technology space as well right so for example tech mahindra has actually tied up with telangana government to build their uh, you know public health registry uh, that's in association with the google similarly microsoft is doing that uh, with hcg which is a hospital chain right uh, infosys is building certain you know virtual reality labs to show how digital twins for the engineering and manufacturing companies uh, would be so the, the basic question the engineering companies have is if i want to set up a digital twin what is my starting point is is there a model available so there are all these kind of things are currently happening ltts has opened a center in, in, in us for that matter right so these changes are, are happening at the moment very very significantly and one change that is underway is you would see that there are a lot of these new technological things are coming out right so i talked about stable diffusion in uh, some of my tweets some time ago not really sure if people are you know really intrigued by what's going on and how that's going to impact the technology trend but you know see all these technologies which are coming up uh, there is a significant fundamental change under way right so if you see amazon so i'm just digressing from a point for a bit and i'll come back so if you see aws is for example is a vertically integrated company right so they manufacture all, their own uh, chips also they they manufacture their graviton chips because they manufacture the chips they know precisely how to route write the software in order to get the most out of out of those chips and it's a, it's kind of a feedback loop so hardware feeds the optimization back to software and software optimizes the usage and io of the hardware right it's a feedback loop and basically what happens is the optimization then percolates down the pyramid until the customer of course our aws is still very expensive for some of the small pocket customers but what i'm trying to say is for a long period of time uh, a typical software has been a memory farm um what do, what do i mean by that is all these softwares that are for example my you know all these big enterprise suites sap microsoft dynamics oracle for that matter right so these software are memory bound that means the outcome or the execution of these softwares are dependent on how much memory is available so that's why you see the you know for example sap came up with sap hana version of their enterprise suite which is basically built on in memory database right so database itself is in the memory so that's why the speed of execution improves right uh, so software for a for a very long period of time has been a memory bomb but with these technologies such as for example the stable diffusion that came in the chat gpt recently came in uh, not not the, the fourth version recently came in gpt3 version was there since quite a long time okay probably people discovered chat gpt only recently uh so all these things that are that are coming in uh, they are slowly moving the focus of the software back on the cpu or a gpu that actually empowers that software right so that small trend is under way there so any company who basically writes programs for hardware or to optimize the chips and so on they also have kind of a tailwind ahead of them so what i'm trying to say is you know uh, we have to broaden up our perspective from looking at only it services companies we have to look at from a technological perspective what are the technological changes that are under way and what will uh, basically you know uh, help investors find the next pocket of uh, pocket of growth sorry for the long introduction
great amaya yeah. so uh, yeah so sashank like coming to you so what what is the starting point of generating the ideas any any screening criteria uh, which you uh, go through before uh, coming to an investment and how how concentrated or diversified you are with your uh, investments so scanning idea you know generally you know as i said you know it has to be a blend of uh, fundamentals like where the you know mostly uh, you know areas that i mostly look at uh, is where the um, where the where the turnaround is happening where uh, basically like for example you know it is on my radar currently and another sector cpsc sector uh, there is one sector that on my radar api and pharma is another one so when see when the turn would happen we don't know okay so i am not interested in getting in early so what i figure out is that uh, what, which are the essential sectors for whatever market cycle we are in and whether they are facing some kind of a downturn temporarily so you keep them on the watch list so these are the ones on the watch list you can say and the second one they were mostly the action is taking place is are the one where uh you know where where the where the technicals are supporting and where you know the momentum is picking up so these are the ones where you know which would attract my active uh, allocation and you know position and risk management so that that's how it is great great so amaya coming to you like uh, day before yesterday or maybe yesterday we had a discussion so there was an analogy taken on the it like they were uh, for the likes of the companies like tcs and fi those were compared as commodities and there were technology companies like kpit tata lxc so they were compared to uh, sp- do you find uh, that is a that is an apt comparison or uh, you uh, differ on this opinion it's a it's a subjective to be very honest uh, i definitely say there is certain commoditized aspect when it comes to the services part like when it comes to the services of course there is certain commoditization exists and but that that commoditization is not bad who says that's bad why is it that when we say that you know it's a commodity business it, it must be bad no it's not it's a bread and butter for many many companies right so services is the fastest fastest revenue yielding vertical for all these big companies that basically empowers their engineering division how did you think hcl actually built their er and d division it's built from the cash flows that are coming from the services uh, you know segment for a long period of time um, back then the ca- access to the capital was not that easily available right so it's available now so you know probably companies are finding easy to get into engineering and all the product related uh, offerings quite easily you know? i'm not denying that another thing is kpit also has a services division which caters to the you know services of their own products right so that is also a small commoditized part i i agree that nobody else can come in and service it it doesn't work until so kya hota hai na like until a product is widely adopted across the industry it doesn't get commoditized right until then there is an edge right so yeah i mean even if even if the commodity commoditization exists that's not necessarily bad that's a bread and butter so that's how i see it <laughs> right so so vineet in between if you have any questions or any short comments to make please feel free to come so sashank uh, coming to risk risk is a very important criteria when we have limited number of trades and we are uh, betting uh, say concentrated bets right so how how we can go about uh, managing risk what is your strategy about it and how we can cut on the greed part which you emphasize uh, is the most important part yeah so uh, on see on the greed part one thing you need to be careful is that no one knows the future okay so uh, let 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 me actually you know uh, explain you in this way so first try to understand why is concentration concentrated investing generally has a bad name generally you know among people that you know because people generally say that you don't know the future okay future is uncertain so you cannot take so high risk on betting so much capital on a particular stock which is i mean which is a valid point we don't know the future and the on the proponents of concentrated investing they say that but you cannot really make big money if you don't bet big on stocks like you know even if you if you read about uh, 
you know, Carl Zikan or Warren Buffett, Jali Munger, all, 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 they all run, you know, like concentrated investing in like, like portfolios. So so where where do we draw the line? What is there for the retail investor to think about this whole thing? So I think my personal opinion is there is a midway. People who say that we don't know everything and we can't be 100% sure about the future, they're right. Because, you know, future is uncertain. How the competition is going to, like, come in or, like, you know, how any kind of a black swan event can come up. It's, it's, very, it's very much possible. So, so what do you do? I mean, in, in this particular case, my way of looking at it is that you manage the greed part. So if you're putting concentrated portfolio in a particular stock or a sector or whatever, you tell yourself that, listen, I do not know the future and I'm going to go step by step. So you manage your greed like this. So you don't tell yourself stories when the stock is going down. The, oh, no, I mean, you know, I went with the thesis, it will happen. No, if it's not happening, you're out. So that, that's, this is how I do uh, manage the greed with a 12% target repeated 50 times. So let's say if I enter a stock, okay, at 100, and the stock goes to, let's say, 115. So I'm sitting on a 15% gain, right? So what I would do mentally is that I would consider uh, my portfolio now at 112. So basically the 12% was my target, right? So I keep my, I, I shift my base to 12 and I strike down that I've completed one trade in my book, which is like, you know, 50 trades that I have to take. So I'll strike one trade. My now, now my you know mental base is not hundred; is hundred and twelve. Now everything will happen on the basis of that figure. So now my second twelve percent figure would be calculated from hundred and twelve, and my risk management will be calculated at eight percent from hundred and twelve, not my initial position. Right. So let's say stock is at hundred and fifteen. So I would wait for my ne next twelve percent. Then I would strike trade number two, right? So, so this basically gives me the objectivity. Objectivity in saying that I'm here to execute my plan and I'm objective when it comes to a stock and I'll be very ruthless in coming out of a stock and protecting my gains, right? So, so as let, let's say, let's assume you are sitting on a big multi-bagger, let's say, we don't know what the multi-bagger would be, but you're st sitting on a stock that is going to move up quite, quite well. Uh, it, it at times very, it becomes very difficult for you to come out of it because you're sitting on so much gains and you're, you're thinking that it might, you know, just go 10 X. So this particular strategy basically helps you in retaining the profits. Right, so this is on the upside if the stock is working. Now let's talk about if when the stock does not work. Now if you if you're sitting on let's say you know hundred and the stock goes to ninety two at ninety two I'm out. So you know I mean it could be whatever reasons, it could be market volatility, it could be you know like anything, I'm out of it. Because you know why? Because see we are coming here to execute a particular strategy. You're not here to you know therefore a specific you know driving our opinions so if if the stock goes really down right and does not move up i'm saved because i'm just out with my eight percent of the capital but if the stock comes back again after a certain point then i reevaluate that stock and then i think of rebuying it so i recently you know like i tweeted uh uh, you know, sometime back, I think to like a day or two back, there was a quote uh, from a book called Monster Investors, uh, Monster Stocks, I think, yeah. And uh, this guy, he he tweeted and he he was actually giving you an example of a guy in US who made uh, in this COVID year 940%. Uh, and he was thinking, he, he also won the US 2020 championship for uh, I think for the for the momentum traders or I think like something like that. So what he did was the same thing. He he basically, you know, drew like he was into Tesla. So he was doing same thing. He got stopped out of that stock due to some kind of volatility, but he did not give up. It was there in the scan, the earnings were coming, but just the price was acting funny. So he he, you know, he concentrated and he came back. 
and that's how he actually you know he was saying that he made big money on that so i think i think my strategy is also something on the you know similar lines don't do not see do not be afraid of getting back into a good stock and be very objective you are here to make money you're not here to prove your thesis wrong or right there are no medals at the end you you can you can you know like exercise that path of being right if you're into public money management because that is a you know it's it's a very different game but as a small retail investor i would i would rather say make your money first and then you know like get into a specific style of investing you in know in a very deep way like for example value investing i think it's it's a, it's, a, it's a wonderful strategy i mean value investing but you know what i have personally experienced is that for a smaller capital base you need to blend things together that's where that's where you would really you know like come out of the shackles of a smaller portfolio yeah uh, hi shashank this is vinit yeah uh, shashank uh, i am also from the uh, similar uh, thoughts i have been running a concentrated portfolio since past 6 7 years maybe uh what i wanted to understand was the your 12% rule uh is it applicable on a stock or is it applicable on the portfolio that's very good because yeah, if good. it is if it is applicable on a stock then probably your portfolio will not be growing by 12% you need uh, your stock to move by at least 12 into number of stocks but yeah that's a very good point we need so so let me let me answer it this way so what how i see it is like this So uh, generally, my rule is not more than five stocks. Okay, so when I have five stocks, okay, so my mental accounting goes like this. So I look at each stock with a twelve percent target, right? Okay, twelve percent is like you know that you know you know the way mentally the things are happening. So if let's say there are times that I just have one stock in my portfolio, and I'm like really high conviction on that. right so in this case it would work, it would work perfectly fine but if i have five stocks okay then i am looking at a portfolio level so portfolio level see individually i am looking for a 12% on each okay but if somehow somehow i have let's say you know there are there is a laggard which is not going down so that i can cut it off but he is like like you know just sitting over there doing nothing which is impacting my portfolio return so at that particular time i i sometimes take a hard decision to basically shift that money to the one that is working so that's that so is it is it <coughs> is it time based or uh, uh, that that decision is based on what so this decision is basically based on uh, you know uh, how fundamentally the company is like you know is 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 working number one and secondly how the price action is behaving is it like uh, you know is it like really overstretched you know, i mean some, some basic technical indicators like you know i mean i personally use uh, macd so that gives you uh, on a shorter time time frame a little bit of a signal on that so and you know see if i let's say i mean if 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 if, if let's say one stock is working in my portfolio really well and the other uh, one is not working uh, i sometimes take a call on going on cash rather than being in the ones where uh, you know uh, things are not that not working that much sometimes i do take a cash, like a cash call but this cash call generally i take after some time after let's say you know let's say at least i'll give a month or two or or let's say you know a quarter because you know quarter would would give you a very good idea because if let's say earnings are also not able to move a stock or earnings have disappointed then it gives you like you know a real uh, you know a trigger to to come out of it the maximum personally i've given uh, you know sideways stocks uh, like 2 to 3 quarters maximum so when you say you need to take 50 trades of 12% you mean to say 12% into 50 time churns of the yes. portfolio or 12 times uh, 12% into 5 uh, uh, number of stocks into 50 so so it's a, again i think good question so five stocks let's say let's say uh, i say to myself that listen i don't want to put one uh, like this money in in one single stock okay i can't do that i have i need to have at least five or seven stocks right so you make basically a team 
like so for example let's say you have seven stocks you say and i would say that okay i've on each stock my average expectation is 12 so my put my my you know like a seven uh, stock team is performing uh, like uh, 12%. So what I have to do in this case is I need to repeat the seven set, the set of seven stocks 50 times. So, so that's 350 so trades. That's 350 unique, like, you know, uh, I would not say unique stocks, but yeah, you can say trades. Yeah, yeah 350, 350 trades with 12% yeah, returns. 350 decisions. Yeah, you can put it like this way. Yeah, three and unique. if some of the decisions go bad, probably this 350 number will go up. Yes. So if 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 this is why this is this is one of the reasons that in my strategy I keep my number of stocks less and I I spend more time on scanning and more time on uh, like you know figuring out stocks because see let's let's understand one thing if you are following this strategy most of the time you should be not doing much because you know getting these type of like what you call monster stocks is uh, you know a rare probability. So, I mean, William O'Neill in his book, he says that, you know, you generally have a 20% uh, success rate as when you like, you know, uh, 20% of uh, finding, let's say if you buy 10 stocks, they would be just like, you know, two or three who would show these characteristics. So he says that when you, when you start off with these strategies, it, it works like that. And, but as you build your eye towards, uh, you know, uh, figuring out it's it's like saying you know you need to figure out what the personality of a multi bagger looks like so so slowly and slowly when you when you train your eye to it that's what like in what i i personally observe is that you start figuring out what kind of uh, you know stocks are the ones who generally give you this kind of returns like you know in technical parlance you say that there are stocks that they they, they do not go uh, below their 50-day moving average. No, come what may. There is some kind of support is there. So what, what's basically the me underlying message over there is that there is some kind of an institutional buying happening there that will protect you from the downside. So, yeah, I mean, that's how that's how I take it. But, you are, it. but you are right on this yes. part that the number of trades would be more if you diversify in the strategy. Right, right. So coming coming to Amea, coming, Amea, the the IT sector index. Do you think uh, it is secular in representation? I mean, if we talk about the pockets uh, in the IT sector, so is it the correct representation, or the, it has uh, means if somebody is following the IT index, does he or she gets the right uh, uh, view on the basis of the movement of index, or there are other, other pockets, or maybe bottoms up approach can do better? Uh, well, to be very honest with you, at index level, it gives a fair bit of idea by market cap which company stands where. Right? That's what the index is for. Uh, but when it comes to the investing side of things, if you see, see, I see, again, we are connecting to the same topic which Shashank is talking about, right? So if you really want to generate a significant alpha, you have to position yourself with a company uh, that is probably in tier three uh, or any tier for that matter, not necessarily in tier one and tier two. But you, are, you have to align with a company and when that company starts changing, from tier 3 to tier 2, tier 2 to tier 1. That is when the maximum alpha generation for retail investors investor happens. Right? Uh, so the pocket of growth and opportunities probably will not be there if you look at the index and probably the, the large constituents of it are all three, four names. Right? So I don't think uh, looking at index in order to perceive what's happening in the sector is the right way to do about you know think about it. Uh, there are there are many other companies in tier two, tier three, or even in case of tier four who are doing some quite a bit of good work. Uh, but again, what happens is at a, when when you go on that you know smaller scale, the reliability of outcome actually goes down, right? So it needs some connect within the industry, some understanding of the sector. If you really have to bet on bet hard on. Or four companies in this segment. 
if you are absolutely new to the to the index then probably it makes sense to look at index uh, but it, in my opinion index is not a representation of what you know what's happening in the sector that's that's how i see it right and say uh, if we, if we talk about diversification within the it so how how you view it uh can you kind of paraphrase your question what exactly you mean by that so See, today, if, should, if should, should a... someone have a diversification or not that's what you're saying yes yes uh, say if we take an example of uh, say healthcare right we have hospitals we have diagnostic we have pharma apis and so so how much mm-hmm. diversification we can do within the it sector that is my question yeah, yeah, or right. maybe so the different verticals yeah yeah you have fair bit of opportunities there at there as well but what happens is you know at what valuation these opportunities are available that's also a kind of a question so for example you have some opportunities in the product systems space uh, within the research space you have erd and engineering services has already come up to be kind of an alternative uh, you know diversification option uh, from the traditional it services right but like you have in pharmaceutical you have hospitals and you have diagnostics and api and chemicals and all these kind of things so that level of diversification probably doesn't exist here because uh, there are some overlaps but then slowly these things are also getting diversified for example you see the latent view is kind of a spin off of a analytics division but any com- any if you take any big company they have you know analytics division probably much bigger much wider much more mature than what latent view is it is kind of a single vertical spin off and not not exactly in literal sense but Uh, that's also one of the diversification opportunities which is available to investors but again i would be little wary of uh, you know uh, doing this diversification because we really don't know uh, how the macro level changes impacts companies who are in the product or in the you know only single vertical or a single technology kind of a uh, space right for an investor uh, i would say even if you go to index investing or you go to the mutual funds that are sector specific again those that you know mutual funds are dominated by top 3 4 5 names so maybe you one can start from there go to the understanding of the domain and slowly understand who is doing what differently and then over a period of time can actually take concentrated bets into the certain pockets right that that's one of op- one approach to look at it but as again you know coming back to the same topic that you i and shashank are discussing the concentration has to be backed by you know right amount of research right amount of understanding of the sector what we call uh, because any erratic concentration would only yield in loss okay uh, so that's i and shashank were just discussing a while ago about the same topic the concentration or diversification right so yeah i mean that's how you can look at it no you, maybe shashank it makes sense to bring that point again uh, we were talking about you know the, the erratic concentration versus the right concentration at the right time absolutely i mean right? yeah yeah i mean see uh, constant see concentrations investing with super high hopes right is very dangerous strategy okay uh, this vo- this a very interesting book by i think uh, phil rosen rosenwig i think the halo effect i would highly recommend people to you know like uh, read that book and read uh, nicholas nasim talib fooled by randomness so these are the books basically you know they will actually ground you that future is uncertain and which is the fact actually so concentration investing firstly it has to be backed by research and it has to you know a lot has to go right for you to get concentrated number one and secondly most of the time most of the time if you if you just read investors who have made big by concentrating read read, read Stan, stanley duck duck and miller and george soros when they took the trade of you know like uh, making a billion dollar by you know uh, trading the you know the, the you know the the i think it was the, yeah the, trading the sterling pound yeah 
So they made a billion dollar over there. And they were saying, all that they said was, this was a no-brainer trade. Everything was going in their favor and they just like, you know, bet very heavily and they made a big amount of money on that. So what, they, what, what pattern that has come out of successful concentrated investors is that mostly those trades look no-brainer. So, yeah, I mean, that's how I would put it. Uh, right, Shashank. So, uh, Shubham, in... uh, one, one to, you know, just before we take one question, uh, Shashank, maybe, you know, hmm. it's interesting to talk about how do we get that randomness out of the, out of the equation, right? For example, we were just talking uh, yeah, was... about your framework of, you know, having 50 trades each of 12%. Uh, and then there was this question that came up that statistically speaking, even if you roll a dice 50%, you don't have a probabilistic outcome. right? Yeah. And then you made a really interesting point about how to get that randomness out of the equation. Maybe you can just focus yes. on that. That's, that, that's it. That's the perspective. Yeah, yeah. And I think there was a gentleman in my, when, when we did this spaces last time, he mentioned a very interesting point that uh, even if you, if you roll the dice 50 times, you just have one sixth of probability of getting uh, the six and he's right you know rolling a dice but but one thing i wanted to add is that here when you're you're picking stocks you're not rolling a dice randomly so there is a framework attached to you know a decision so what you do what you're doing here is you are actually reducing the probability of not getting a six by scanning stocks through fundamental technical and momentum you know uh, filters so so let let's say that we have to roll the dice 50 times okay what if i tell you that each time you are rolling a dice you have a 80 percent probability of getting a six so in that particular particular thing that particular way if you calculate the probability the probability holistically would come out to be very different it will not be one sixth so the larger point we are trying to make over here is that if you are want if you want to do this kind of investing you really have to spend a lot of time or take help from people who are experts in these three fields one is fundamental one is techno funda and one is momentum you see as a retail investor with small capital right your only objective should be to make capital first and then then you know romanticize yourself about marrying with a particular strategy because see respect the fact Respect the fact that you will not get uh, a hang of a particular strategy, be it value, momentum, or techno funda, in by you know like in in a very quick span. You would at least need to see two to three market cycles, right, for you to ex have an expertise on that strategy. But that does not mean that in the meantime you're not going to make money. So make money smartly. How? Take help from the value guys. Like, you know, a lot of great value investors, like, you know, having the subscription services in India. Take help from those. Take help from, let's say, techno funda guys, some of them. And take help from, let's say, you know, a momentum services guy, right? So what has happened here is you have basically, let's say, hired three people for you who do the work and get you the, you know, the right, let's say, names. And then you blend things together. But the only thing that you have, at least you should do is have a basic understanding of what value does through by reading books or, you know, doing something. So have a, have a, you know, a hang of each strategy, hire the best people, get the names scanned for you, and then start, you know, investing money. That's, I think, uh, that's where you would reduce your probability of, you know, getting wrong. Yeah. Uh, right. What? So this this multi bagger thing is much overrated. So Sashank and Amiya, the question is to both one by one. So how how we should multiply our money is the main thing, right? At the end of the day, we are here to make money, not about. It's not uh, a fancy thing that you made a hundred x or two hundred x. At the end of the day, your portfolio multiplied by. How much is what matters to everyone? So how you see it and what's your view on this multi-bagger overrating thing? Amir and Shashankya. Amir, do you want to go ahead first? 
Okay. Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, am I still audible? Because I see Shashank speaking. No, no, you you are audible. I was just saying that you know you can go. Okay, correct. Right. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. Ah, uh, yeah. See, uh, you know, hindsight. If I look at the way I was looking at the whole multi-barrier concept uh, back, probably back in two thousand ten, two thousand twelve time period. But say when you have a small capital, of course, the primary intention is to grow the base, right? Uh, so if I go back a decade ago. Uh, in my investing journey, I would say that I never actually bothered about what's value investing, what's momentum investing, and what's that and what's this. I never really bothered about. And again, uh, don't take my word for it. It's just how market was back then. There was no, you know, influx of information. There was no flooding of information back then available. But uh, I, I have to be very honest with you. Uh, the large part of my portfolio. and the the significant multiplication that i have generated or the significant alpha that i have generated i have generated that from the front line companies uh except recently for what i have made in it companies since 2018 2019 so if i leave that part aside the largest alpha that i have generated that has actually come from companies that probably don't even trade now okay so again there is a downside risk to it i mean there is a always full Risk to the capital, uh, but this whole multi-bagger thing has to be seen from the market perspective. Market कौन से phase में है अभी, right? So one uh, thing I really, you know, feel from my experiences, I mean, whatever, whatever my limited experiences, uh, multi-baggers तभी बनते हैं जब you know depressing situation होती है. So that's the sort of sort of depressing situation or a prolonged uh you know grinding kind of a market is a precursor to discovering new multi bagers but when you are at the euphoria it's not possible and it's not realistic realistic to expect to find a multi bagger of course what kaisa hota hai na fir then you start changing the levels initially you find multi bagger very easy then it becomes very really difficult so you go to the small cap and mid cap segment mid cap and small cap segment then it becomes even more difficult as and when you know the stocks twitter pe aana shuru hote hain and then everybody talks about it threads aana shuru hote hain then the game shifts even further down to the micro cap and nano cap companies and then wo bhi discover ho jata hai then suddenly smes ka trend aana shuru ho jata hai the similar thing i have seen in 2014 in 2014 also there were Uh, you know there was sudden spike in interest in sme investing and it lasted for 2 3 years but it ended really very bad in 2017 or something when actually that is entire you know sme bubble burst back then i am not saying there is a bubble but the point is a retail investor cannot make significantly large amount of money unless he or she learns to sell and that's one big thing i would i would have to say not necessarily you always need a multi bagger to make significant amount of money if you learn to sell you will still keep that money and as shashank explained your your base shifts from 100 to 112 right so you have to keep on moving that way so that's how i look at multi baggers and a certain ek portfolio ka size banne ke baad mein it really doesn't matter whether you find a new multi bagger or not because it really depends like हर किसी के टारगेट के ऊपर डिपेंड करता है आई वांट टू मेक 100 क्रोस आई वांट टू मेक 500 क्रोस ऐसे आपके अगर एक्सपेक्टेशंस है सो दैट्स अ डिफरेंट थिंग बट इफ यू हैव अ रियलिस्टिक एक्सपेक्टेशन नॉट आई एम नॉट सेइंग दैट इज नॉट अ रियलिस्टिक एक्सपेक्टेशन बट यू हैव अ डिफरेंट एक्सपेक्टेशंस लाइक आई वांट टू यू यू नो बी फाइनेंशियली इंडिपेंडेंट एंड आई वांट टू हैव अ सिग्निफिकेंटली गुड पोर्टफोलियो साइज योर एक्सपेक्टेशन फ्रॉम अ मल्टी बैगर पर्सपेक्टिव चेंजेस वेरी सिग्निफिकेंटली और यू स्टार्ट गेटिंग हैप्पी इवन इफ यू स्टार्ट हिटिंग 12 percent cagr 18 percent cagr is like you know god like for you right and eventually what happens is your your churn reduces at that time and the the biggest risk in investing and finding multi baggers is if you are finding multi baggers in the lower lower strata of the companies jahan pe float hi nahi hai you will probably have on paper multi bagger but if you don't have the float to exit then it becomes even more challenging right so that's my view on it shashank on to you 
I think I think I would hundred percent agree to what you you know said. First thing is that you know, multi bagger as a you know as a as you know as a perspective in generally all depends on the valuations, where you enter and where you exit. If you are trying to make money from a single stock, let's say you know you want to say you want to make ten twenty x and all. And honestly speaking, you know multi baggers happen. They're not planned. so you know how how the future is going to roll up and everything how the you know all, all the all these things you know come together at an inflection point for you to give those returns it's it's a it's a still you know it's a futuristic bet and future at best is dealt with probabilities so having said that uh, then then you know what do we do then so i mean why is it that this multi bagger thing in generally gets spoken about a lot so i think one of the reasons is that this strategy is not bad per se but this suits the most uh, to people who have a very large capital base so see a large capital base cannot you know come in and out of a stock very easily let's say you know this 12% thing that i was telling you can you imagine an institutional investor or a hni you know with multi you know 100 of crores of portfolio doing this no it's not possible so naturally this inclination towards finding multi bagger suits uh, either the fund managers or uh, you know the hnis or let's say you know uh, like super uh, or, or i would even say uh, financially in, already financially independent investors see of someone who is already financially independent has no in my opinion should have no urge to go and you know take undue risks in the market so he would be you know he would want to like you know invest and hunt for multi baggers and sit and wait because he has no pressure but the people who are coming in the in the market with smaller capital in the beginning they want to grow their portfolio fast and in the least stressful way so either they can actually look for these strategies where the success rate is less on the multi bagger thing or they can actually consistently make money even from you know large caps or i would say you know uh, smaller large caps mid caps or i can even go to let's say you know larger small caps that that kind of a pool it's very easy uh, for you to make money and, and see understand one thing multi baggers in generally you know there's that j curve of a 20 or a 100x that happens so like you know stock becoming from going from a small cap to a let's say micro cap to a large cap is very less the odds of you finding at least in the beginning stage of your investing journey is very less so why do you want to play that game and and apparently every retail investor generally when they come to the market come with that opinion that we want to like you know break away with that so so yeah that's that's my point of view that you know you can when see your capital size is small and the mid and large or let's say relatively larger small cap space can multiply the capital for you with some kind of a certainty i think i would rather look at that kind of a space to 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 reduce my risk of blowing up also the thing is that multi bagger happen kind of in a hindsight true right, right exactly yeah the tier the tier shift that you we were talking about or the tier shift of the it company that i talked about It's when you when you actually look at that from uh, you know the current frame of things, it's not really easy to anticipate whether the company would shift a tier and go up in the value chain or not. Uh, it's a you know that's why I said that the multi baggers and the tier shift these things you can do you know dream you can anticipate right. you can think, but whether that happens or not, the answer is only in the hindsight. Absolutely, hundred percent agree. plus shashank i feel uh, last two years have spoiled uh, most of the investors uh, to hunt for bigger returns pre pre covid uh, people were happy with uh, 15 16% return uh, from markets and now people want to you know uh, look for a bigger outsized return and which is actually leading to a lot of frenzy in some of the pockets of the market but uh, again uh, it all depends on a person's uh, realistic expectation and the experience in the market what they should expect from it uh, yeah, i mean we need i'll touch this point a little differently see uh, 
when you when we come to the market in generally all all of us have high expectations and everything i think where people are going wrong in their expectations is they want to make that high return from a single stock that is where the you know expectation is uh, going wrong if you if you manage your greed right if you manage your greed and take multiple trades i think still it is possible like let's say for example let's take the time of 2017 i think 18 time which was which was very tough for the market because everyone was invested in small caps they could not get out and suddenly there was some other part of the market that started working so firstly they could not shift their capital and then there was a issue that you know they could not buy the ones that were working so i think uh, the way investor in my opinion should look at it is that fine you you can have high expectation of returns from the market but you need to be flexible with your approach you cannot approach single handedly in one single way and still generate high returns so in 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 the strategy that i follow cash calls are very often like if you if you see mark minervini he has been like you know on, on cash calls since uh, the beginning of the year i think november he he called out that he was going on cash i think november 2000 uh, 2021 yeah i remember so i mean taking cash calls when when your setups when your when your strategy is not working is also very you know critically important and uh, you know balancing out you know uh by putting in money in those sectors who are work, that are working is is again you know again uh, very 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 critical all right so 100% we, we speaker who have must have some questions so ramakrishna you can unmute and ask your question and also guys the forum is open for questions so anyone uh, from the attendees if uh, they have any question they can send in a speaker request yeah ramakrishna you can unmute and ask sir i have one doubt nighty sector hello yeah yeah go ahead yeah sure sure please go ahead I, I have one doubt. Uh, actually, I have in three A input exits uh, around those eight hundred. Can I hold it? Can I sell these shares uh, day to day? All that stock. Any strength is there? I, can I hold it? Please, your opinion. Ah, uh, Rama Krishna, we are very sorry. This forum is not yeah. for <laughs> telling any buy sell thing. But but again, if uh, no, no, not sell. What is your opinion in future growth? Like, Amiya, you wanna take it? The uh, IT sector yeah, yeah, yeah. only. Yeah, I'm asking <laughs> nothing about uh, sell or buy. Can I hold that? Like uh, any like uh, average? Like I have doubt only. See, be very honest on certain aspects. See when. a sector is in you know secular uptrend so everything basically flies right and whenever there are micro headwinds then how much each individual tier company gets impacted or gets corrected that that is you know that that's not a secular uh, drawdown that each company takes now coming back to 3i infotech uh well to be very honest it's very down in the value chain uh when we talk about the revenues and uh, you know what they are doing but again the point is everything is a buy at a certain point everything is a sell at a certain point so it really depends at what value you are holding it so if you are holding price is let's say in a single digit then why not just go on and hold but i would i would rather say don't get into averaging down you know companies which are very down the value chain like the i protect so if you if you are average is very low in a single digit probably you have a cushion to hold it right so just one thing i would add over here is that i mean before taking a sell decision or you know like coming out of a position you should also ask this question to you that would you be comfortable buying the same stock again if it starts moving up or you know when your thesis is like you know proven wrong So I think that that's also one of the you know critical elements of taking a sell decision. 
so sashank and amia like you talked about selling so that's a very very critical and important aspect of uh, any any investment right so what what is the ideal criteria and uh, i mean are you guys able to keep emotions away when it comes to sell because sell obviously comes with regrets right because at times we feel uh, we didn't sell on time and there are times when we think we sold early so what are your opinion on this and then we take question from neeraj yeah so my my perspective you know prince is that selling becomes regretful only and only once when you tell yourself that you cannot reenter back selling re- regretful hai kyu well, let, let's let's break this down why why does selling becomes regretful oh i mean oh, i was holding the stock this became the moment i sold that started moving up so ask yourself first question that what what stopped you from buying that thing again most of the time you would get the answer that you know i had an anchor bias toward a particular price and that's a bias right that is not a rational call and second thing second you know uh, you know excuse that you would give that there is no margin of safety ab isme margin of safety nahi rahi because i was expecting this uh, to to make at least 5x from this stock now it has only already moved up you know 30 40% so now i will wait for it to come back right so how to counter these kind of thoughts you counter these kind of thoughts by managing your expectations by limiting your greed right this is why i keep this rule of 12% that i look objectively at a stock even if i'm looking at a screaming like you know a multi bagger i would still objectively look at a 12% gain and i'll keep you know building on that so when i let, let's say if i give you an example uh, for example you know some stock that comes onto my radar and it was let's say on my radar but i stopped like you know forgot buying it or i did not buy due to whatever reason okay now when i look at that stock again what goes in my mind is that oh listen this stock has started performing this was like you know uski earnings bhi aa rahi hain usme momentum bhi hai there is a technical aspect also that is working why don't i reenter back when i only have an expectation of 12% so the moment you manage your greed you will reenter into the stock you know very easily now coming to a question on when to sell you know firstly you know that it has to be fundamentally driven some kind of a thing when it is not working okay that is one part of it but technicals and momentum are the two indicators that are going to give you the in this uh, message of selling first before the numbers will come in because there are like you know the, trusting the technicals is like saying there are people with larger capital with the more resources who are more aware than i am who are taking the decision right now which i might take in months to come or uh, like weeks to come so respecting certain level of technical technicals would help where you would say you know the wyckoff theory of distribution so that is one thing and uh, that yeah the so technicals to sell and then to rebuy is the psychological part that if let's say the distribution has happened now the stock has come down are there the triggers like you know coming up for me to rebuy the stock so so yeah that's how i see it Amiya, you can add. Ah, uh, well, I will try to wrap up this quickly since there might be some other questions as well. But just to answer you, Prince, uh, to be very honest, during the initial phase of my investing journey, uh, selling, I am not going to be very honest with you because I wanted to have that glorified story to tell that I have a fifty bagger, I have a bagger, I have a bagger, I have a bagger. right right so 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 that's how it that's all we tell you mentally as well uh, and as you grow in the market your expectation really starts coming down and that's when you actually discover that the only way to get rich in market is stocks that i used to hold uh, so it really depends on the opportunity size and uh, you know 
there is if this if there is any other better opportunity available that would grow at a better rate and so on uh, but you know you should keep on speaking with people who are you know handling like 100 plus crores of portfolios uh, or who are investors with ultra high net and one constant uh, message that comes from all these kind of big investors is uh, the moment stock grows beyond 50 60% they start selling 2%, 5%, 2%, 5%. By the time stock is, you know, up 2x, their entire capital is out of it, and then they still continue selling it. And again, we come to the same point that Sashank was driving at, that you don't expect the entire multi-bagger return from one stock. So you make, a, you make money, you move out of it, you don't immediately put that money back in market because kya hota hai? when you have experienced significant gains from certain stock it you know you start thinking highly of there is a risk of you start thinking highly of your stock picking skill uh which should have been attributed to luck but we attribute it to, to skills and we may make a mistake right so i have seen these big investors they they never stay in a stock beyond two three x again their capital is huge so probably it makes sense for them uh but they sell at a certain point as a rule, regardless of where stock goes, we always say that this is not Right? Uh, and what happens is when they make that significant money from a from that position, they sit over it and they move that cash into liquid funds or short-term funds and let that feeling of you know having made so much money settle down, come back on the ground, and then start objectively looking at. So, yeah, we can take uh, questions. Yeah, Neeraj, you can unmute and ask your question. Uh, okay, I have also similar views. I am not looking for any specific uh, query regarding the stocks which I have. I want to give my take on the philosophy of investment. Basically, 99% of us, I am talking about the retailers, we want to get more thrill rather than uh, making a meaningful money out, out of the stock market. Neeraj, I, I have a small request, like please wrap it up in 30 seconds or a minute because uh, our speakers are short of time, so we have a limited time with them. So, uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, are you guys uh, giving us uh, like specific Stock query? No direct questions on stocks. Yeah, framework or maybe maybe business overview we can discuss with the permission of the speakers. Yeah. Okay, I'm uh, a bit biased on the new tech companies. Like uh, I can give a name, but not uh, like uh, I need a specific view on that company. Like Map My India, which is a competitor of Google Maps. How do you see uh, its growth or uh, this kind of business growth in India or in or you can say in the world as a competitor to the giant Google the navigation uh, technology yeah. yep I'm, I'm pretty a bit about it to be very honest with you Neeraj uh, but again when it comes to investing uh, it's all together different thing at what valuation is currently available that's that's the point in uh, in, in content, right? So we are not really sure what valuations uh, each individual is comfortable uh, investing no, in the no, company. See, but when it comes to the AI is that the products that they are coming we, up with. Why should, we, why should we bother about the valuation if our horizon is, let's say, 10 years? And we are seeing a potential and in the one company. Thing I have, and one thing I have learned is, I agree with you, uh, but, you know, the drawdowns have taught me that you know, it's easier to say that my my time frame is ten years. But if you are if you are really keen on taking all that drawdown, uh, you you really don't know, right? What what drawdown this 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 market would basically beat a certain company down to? You're not really sure about it. So what I'm trying to say is use these use these market crashes kind of an opportunity to to you know. No, no, I'm saying is build position gradually in these companies rather than going all aggressive, all in. 
at the same yeah, time. Uh, yeah, that right? is, so, so these companies, kya, kya, sir, I'll tell you something. These are all new age companies, I would say, or the technology companies that are coming from India. It, it will take market and market participants to come to a certain maturity when it comes to how to look at these companies from a growth perspective. What is the right valuation model? What is the right framework and so on and so forth. And typically, I have seen these all big technology names that have that have come out in the past two three years. When I go to IPO, say 30-40 percent ke aspas ki range mein hamesha mil jaati hai two three years baad, right? So my only suggestion is if we have you know really good faith in the technology and it it really is a good technology to be very honest with you. I'm very upbeat about it. Upbeat on the GPS navigation system getting adopted in all the you know automobile industry. <coughs> so so just just i'll i'll like you know add one small point to it that see the people who sold these stocks to retail investors the institutional investors who did that let them buy that back the stock once again you 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 can study the business model you can actually study the company okay let them make the base let them buy it and then you you know jump in along with them that that's how absolutely I, that's how i would you know look absolutely at it. absolutely yeah because see, another question when the valuation is important because see uh, automobile industry ka adoption hai drone industry ka adoption hai but wo kitna abhi ke price mein factored in hai we don't know that right and that is primarily why these stocks are witnessing such huge drawdowns and sashank made a very interesting point let these people who have sold uh, this stock to retailers let them come back and buy it again yeah so see the thing is that very simple stock price moves on the basis of demand and supply right and and except one fact that we as retail investors do not have enough money to either create a demand or a supply so all that we can do is you come with your thesis to the market that okay let's say my uh, let's say i'm studying map my india and it let's say it would do good perfectly fine you come with your thesis but you execute your thesis when the people with bigger money are also on your side there is no point executing your thesis when you're on the opposite side because ultimately they will push the pressure down on whichever direction you are so it's it's like you know uh, like uh, you know swimming upstream why would you want to do that that's how i look so sashank every quarter with every quarter result we can add a few i think that should be the best approach because if margins are abnormal the company is unique so we can have a look on the earnings of the company every quarter and we can uh, take a decision based on the earnings irrespective of who is buying who is not in the beginning let's say first first couple of years as long as the earnings are supportive let the stock uh, crash to any level no, ultimately but, but, it has to come up but let me let me ask you one question what if a competitor a company which we don't know currently comes up and who takes away yeah, the market share this is what we need to study yeah, yeah see this is what, what we have we know about the company so if i am talking about the specifically this company it is uh, it has been doing its ground work since mm-hmm. 1995 the building uh, of mapping mapping the entire india mm. that work uh, is a very cumbersome job it's not a one year or two year job so any competition uh, has to go through all that and they are far ahead of of any future competitor right uh, th- thanks thanks neeraj for your input so we move on to next question shashank so shashank uh, how you see the role of macros in mixing these three uh, strategies Uh, i think macros do play a role uh, macros do play a role because it basically gives you uh, an idea of where the money is kind of shifting so so i mean uh, let me give you a small example so if you if you take a macro call on the let's say you know the the us sec- us you know tech space so a lot of you know big macro trading desks and all if you read their uh, interviews and all so what the call they are tra- like you know making is that that the, the that the era of risk capital is gone use this bear market to basically look for sectors which are going to lead the next bull market so you know 
i would be of an opinion that making uh, your next let's say you know you know big gain or something uh you should like you know follow the macros in terms of where the money is flowing to which sectors to which markets and uh, accordingly you know you know uh, take a call on that like for example like you know if let's say fed is increasing the rates right so your your immediate trigger should be that you know uh, this would not bode that well for any company which is like you know uh, where the hope of earning is there but the earnings are not there high pe ones so like you know something that happened in the us markets and all so so these are the you know the larger you know macro trends that a uh, general retail investor should take care of but don't go too much into it because you know macros are also linked to geopolitics a lot and geopolitics is again you know politics so you might end up spending a lot of time over there but i would i would rather say that you know have a cursory understanding of macros but rather use charts and have some like knowledge of charts to use because see a macro gives you an opinion but chart gives you the proof of whether that opinion is being exercised by the smarter people or not so i would use this way macro charts and then fundamentals in the you know like from in making an opinion but again you know fundamentals are the real ones which are going to make or break for you because if macros is there if technicals are there but the earnings are not coming that won't work fair enough so there is question in the comments from rajan singh he is asking shashank can we briefly touch upon the macro and sector allocation in perspective of india growth story for at least next 3 to 5 year uh see sect um, on the macro front i can tell you that you know uh, emerging markets generally in like you know from a cyclical point of view would receive a lot of fundings so th- there is, this is one thing and the and the you know if you mix a little bit with the geopolitical situation that we are going through currently uh the shifting of the manufacturing base i would not say that 100% of things will come out of china but you know the work has already you know started so like having you know uh, this particular as a this particular opinion as a base you can say that you know the industrial and the cap good sector in india should uh, really show you know me some meaningful growth and on that you can add to you know the local uh, government policies like for example in the railway sector in the defense sector and all and you know that is throwing you a lot of uh, you know opportunities uh, to 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 get the right uh, you know uh, right stocks and their allocation over there so yeah on, on the larger base you know that's how i see and i think uh, for india in for india per se i'm i'm, I'm pretty bullish and uh, yeah with that tone i would just you know like uh, go with the flow and you know i have like come to terms with the you know thing is that i have a larger picture or a larger view but at the end of the day my execution decisions are based on what's like you know what's happening on the ground what's like you know really happening and you know i use you know charts as a shorthand for that so yeah overall bullish but yeah cautious with uh, choosing where your money should go to right so amia the questions uh, on macros to you also like how much role macros play in your investing and uh, on the top of that any any other sectors which you see uh, money can be made or you are very positive about two three sectors for next 3 to 5 years yeah well to be honest macro plays a certain role but uh, i don't look at it uh, very significantly uh, when it comes to my core investment uh, stocks uh, but yeah i mean if you look around what's happening around the globe in various segments for example what's happening in in and around europe with the energy and what are the alternatives that these countries are looking to build so there are huge opportunities in certain spaces with the you know the energy and the infra space uh, so that is one one small pocket that you can actually look at who are the companies that would uh, get benefited out of this for example germany is currently focusing on building a very significant capacity of lng terminals right so to 
we have any kind of a proxy available in india so that's one segment second uh, engineering services and basically the digital core that is one segment i'm very very a bit about and i have spoken about this since a long time is uh, you know the time of this digital engineering has still not come uh, the iot's and all these kind of technologies are still not mature because it requires a certain reliable communication backbone and with 5g being available i think lot of uh, you know good digital engineering stories could come out of india uh, where you know the, the digital twins and the digital transformation uh, of the core industries because for for too long these industries have operated in a in a traditional model right so i see that one pocket uh, the digital engineering would pick up probably sometime you know three four years down the line um so that is another pocket which uh, i'm very very a bit about um uh, then uh, again you know uh, i don't i don't know much about the infra from the india perspective to be very honest but if you look at look in and around what's happening in europe what's happening in china i'm pretty sure there must be proxies that are available uh, in many segments uh, piping infra uh transportation uh digital engineering digital core i think you know one if, if you see it back in 2017 18 these it companies who are building skills and capabilities in the cloud engineering services and after covid happened we actually saw the you know the alpha getting generated out of that pocket so whoever had the scale you know delivered the the maximum a similar thing is happening in the digital core space as 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 of now and there is a lot of backfilling that is happening so if you look at large manufacturing companies or the engineering companies or energy utility companies uh they are adopting digital at a very very increased rate so that is also one of another pocket that i would be certainly looking at and as i said the communication is a backbone of everything so certain pockets in telecommunication is also very good um so yeah i mean these are certain pockets i'm i'm looking at and very very a bit about all right so ramakrishna you have another question or uh, you joined okay there is one question in the comments i read it out for you so the question is uh, from arun arun is asking uh, what is the criteria uh, criteria to find leader during bottom of market how do you find opportunity in sideways market or maybe current market scenario so firstly you know in a sideways market the only way you can make money is by selling options and that i would not recommend to any investors like you know especially retail investors with like you know no knowledge because see in in, in selling options is what you do is basically you gain the premium who you because the stock does not move anywhere and whosoever has uh, you know bought the contract from you his value of the contract goes to zero so that's how you make money and there is a there is a good book if you want to understand if you want to make like you know understand how to make this money there is a little book on sideways market so you can actually google it and you will get it uh on the and what was the second part of his question uh if we have uh, Le- uh, how to find a leader during the bottom of market or bear phase of market so leader in generally leader when when the markets are bottoming out generally leaders firstly they fall less as compared to the others so that is basically a proof that the smarter investors are buying and they will be the first one to touch their uh, you know all time or 52 week high when uh, you know the market rebounds so you can say you know eggs and ball like tennis balls right so eggs would stay on the floor and the tennis ball would you know come up so this is like you know one way to 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 to, to figure out and mostly when when the you know the downfall is over it is going to be like you know mostly a, a sector that has come as a whole like for example if something is going in a particular sector all of those stocks would come start coming up so that is one kind of a criteria to see that you know which sector is coming up so yeah so ramya do you want to add anything on this uh you're on ramya you're on mute uh 
i think we must have some issues on the... anyway mm-hmm. so ramakrishna if you can hear us uh, do you have any question or you joined again uh... Uh. is it better yeah me yeah yeah okay okay so so amia uh, like uh, when it comes to human behavior that is beyond control and uh, uh, we often see when the sectors are not in flavor then it normally happens that uh, especially the retail investor they they panic sell or maybe they keep away from the sector and that basically gives an edge to the investors who uh, who or maybe hni is or maybe institutional investors to accumulate big chunks but like coming to the question how how long you can think a sector like it can be out of flair because it is back, backbone of every single industry because uh, in in an era of uh, maybe say technology or digital era without it we cannot we cannot think of any any sector so how how you see it and what's your view on this how long it can be uh, out of flavor say the honest answer is i don't know <laughs> uh but you know from my perspective it really doesn't matter to me how long it stays out of flavor see the thing is these periods of uh, long grind or long depression really good period for retail investors to basically accumulate a certain position size in a given stock um if you are in a continuous uptrending market you really don't get to size your positions well where the dividends which are coming out of that investing start making any sense to you right so if you are if you are not making any meaningful dividend out of your position and neither that position is is any meaningful to you nor that dividend right uh so the way i see it is uh, you know when market actually tumbles and you know if there is there is risk everywhere that's where the having certain understanding of the sector really helps because kai bar aisa hota hai ki market discontinued hota hai dono side mein so when we say that how long it will stay out of the flavor so you have to ask the question ki jo growth humne pichle ek do saal mein dekhi thi itne sare narratives uske andar built in the ya nahi the right so until all those settle down the sector won't turn around right i mean that could be one of the ways to look at it uh, second is uh, you know is whenever the you know things are going really really bad i typically turn to sectors which i understand well uh, and people actually say that you know the association close with the industry is not really good but to be very honest with you i've been doing that for since 2015 16 and uh, abhi tak to rewards uske kafi acche rahe hain right so i would just say that you know if you have a good understanding of a sector long grinding periods are really good for you to accumulate a right position size so that eventually when it actually the turn around happens of course there is a time value attached to it right and it is the thing is ye sare na cheeze pehle pata nahi thi ka logo ko aisa nahi hai ki time value hai there is a uh, you know opportunity cost or a time cost and all these kind of things but ye jo twitter pe threads likhe jaate hain na wo cheeze ko na bahut hi alag perspective mein likhe jaate hain uh, i know some investors who you know who used to be very very a bit about certain stock which didn't move for 10 years and uh, i interacted with one such investor when i was in india and the fellow told me yaar ki mujhe pata hai ki company mein kya ho raha hai and it's just that the fundamentals are backfilling uh, and the price is not reacting so kab tak chalega it's okay as long as the market doesn't want to give it a premium or doesn't want to you know Uh, give it a moment and i'm absolutely fine with it so that gentleman ended up accumulating that stock for 7 8 years and after that that stock just rallied and i don't know how many times it got you know uh, multiplied from that point onwards so it really depends on the when mera genuine suggestion ye hai na ki twitter pe ye narratives time value ye sab pad ke na khud ka ek jo framework develop kiya hoga agar aapne don't really bother disturbing that because that framework is specifically bespoke to your investor psyche 
and you should stick to it so it's if just because somebody is coming up and saying there is a time value there is a opportunity cost and all these kind of things it necessary it doesn't really make any sense if you are a genuine patient investor you understand the sector well just stay in build your position size eventually the sector turn arounds happen over a period of time you will have your moment that's how i see it i, I see it you know it can be both straight forward and simple here you know, we don't have to complicate it there is a period of grind that you will be you will have to go through when you will start doubting your decisions i still remember when i was invested in two of my core it companies it and technology companies i used to talk to my close friends that yaar itna potential hai itna sab kuch ho raha hai but the price is just not moving what and i think i should sell okay and i used to ended up saying no 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 this is not what i want to do i want to hold i know what's going to happen over a period of time it's a discretionary period i have to give it in and eventually that thesis played out exactly the way i anticipated so i think everybody should discover what framework works for you just follow it if you are a momentum trader then you really don't you really don't have to bother about sector kab up trend mein aayega like sushant said right being little late in a trade is like having an insurance that you are right right so you can follow that strategy or follow this strategy <laughs> yeah so so see i'll i'll give you my perspective on this firstly ask yourself what are you buying stocks for to make money correct now the, the your answer should be like what amount of money i'm trying to make so like you know let's say some people on the value investing framework they want to say that i want to like you know make money by not losing a lot so i would buy you know cheaper and i would gain the maximum amount of money through percent high percentage returns on that particular stock on the techno fund or the momentum side person would say that i would also make the same amount of money that the value investing guy is making but with a lesser percentage return but with a high allocation the reason i'm going for the high allocation is because i have a probability of not waiting long so again like amia said if you let's say you are a you know uh, let's say relatively you are financially independent you are institutional you are a fund manager and all uh, by all means if you have the right knowledge and then thesis and the framework please wait but if you are coming as a novice guy i would i would rather say you know protect your gains and capital and look at a strategy of growing it faster because you know developing a framework on the fundamental side takes time so you know kind of you know uh, strike a balance on uh, on you know what you are here to do and what you want to do and all and in the longer term extreme long term like you know having this kind of a framework of uh, buying and holding generally works uh, pretty well because your capital size is huge and then you know uh, you need to be mindful of that so yeah that that's my view on this Uh, right so shashank uh, also like to talk about the how how you pyramid your positions so say if the momentum continues and you have gained certain per, uh, percentage on your initial uh, investment so so you trail that right but again how you pyramid what are your thought process behind doing those and how how uh, you see there are limitations to your system and how you manage that so i mean starting position generally are like you know uh, 5% so i gradually 5 10 20 50 80 80 so that that's how i you know like you know follow in terms of uh, uh, you know averaging up so generally my uh, if i have to allocate big it will come within uh, 20% of the move agar like if i have to go beyond 50% so within that move i would allocate it and on the um on the risk management side as i said again you know 8% is my rule so yeah and i do that and and sometimes it also happens that i do close positions before this 12% thing so i can actually it happens that you know you do not like the price action or you do not like something that i it happened that i closed positions at 8% 9% after you know they get the the stocks went sideways for like uh a long time so that's how i do it but uh, see averaging up the basic of averaging up should be followed by like this is the company earnings uh, like is the you know the narrative that is built into the price uh is followed by earnings or not 
if it is getting followed by earnings by all means you know stay there and try to add more and start looking objectively how things are so i mean since my strategy is already concentrated i do not have to worry too much about averaging up because ab aur kitna average karoge aur paisa kahan se aayega jab waisi concentrated ho so yeah that's how i see right right so so amaya one last question uh, before we close so when we have a very uh, i mean say limited uh, uh, knowledge about a sector that is a that is an issue to go big at least but what do you think if we have uh, a great understanding of a sector expectations as far as investing is concerned sir can you repeat the last part uh, so, so basically my point is, the sector, so basically there could be two uh, point like if you understand a sector uh, with limited knowledge and there is uh, an instance when a person has a great knowledge about the sector right so does that also bring some hindrance or maybe uh, a, a road block in uh, i mean there could be some mental blocks when you understand things too well because there are times when you have to give yeah, up yeah yeah absolutely 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 so you know what typically happens when you are very close to sector is you know there is some, there's something called a sammy's wall syndrome so typically uh, you know you start looking at certain companies very highly and you start looking companies certain companies very lowly and that that very frequently happen that typically happens that's why i said right only sir circle of competence or understanding of the sector is not really enough there are there is this great talk that shashank shared uh, i think divesh shah uh, was the speaker right shashank divesh shah yeah that's correct yeah yeah uh, yeah yeah so you you know yeah you should go and listen to 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 him uh, what a what a fantastic talk that is so you know he uh, he is a very senior investor and bahut kam unke bare mein baat ki jati hai and it's really uh, kind of a you know gold mine of a discussion that he had with uh, i don't remember the speakers kon the i think nuresh nuresh bhai the i think yeah, yeah. nuresh uh, yeah. yes so you know what he says in that talk is main matlab ki comes from a gujarati family jo business karte hain hamesha se uh, he said that mujhe kuch pata nahi tha jab it ka boom shuru hua tha i had no clue about it and he was investing back then in ssi so i'm sure jo log 2002 2004 2004 mein engineering mein the they must be knowing about ssi because typically c c++ ke courses karne har koi ssi jaya karta tha us time pe so uh, he was investing back then in ssi and he did some you know fundamental research on the company and there is only limited level up to which a particular person who is not from a software background could understand so he made a really good point ki aapko bahut zyada promoter ke level ka understanding aane ka zarurat nahi hai kisi bhi company mein se agar aapko acha paisa banana hai to aapko sirf ye dekhna hai ki unka direction sahi hai kya market ne us unko sahi position kiya hai kya sahi sentiment mein wo aya hai kya and momentum hai kya so if everything is working out you can still make money with let's say only 20 30% of understanding of the sector and another downside of having circle of competence in one sector is you tend to you know stay in your comfort zone because you know industry knowledge aane ke liye time lagta hai it takes a significant period of time to understand certain industry horizontally vertically क्रॉस स्ट्रीम में क्या यू नो क्या वर्क करता है क्या नहीं वर्क करता है जियो पोलिटिकली ग्लोबली क्या वर्क करता है इट टेक्स टाइम फॉर दैट अंडरस्टैंडिंग टू कम एंड इट्स अ ग्रेजुअल पीस ऑफ वर्क यू नो आई हैव स्पेंड अबाउट 17 इयर्स इन द इंडस्ट्री वर्किंग प्रोफेशनल कैपेसिटी एंड इट्स ओनली इन लास्ट 7 इयर्स आई स्टार्टेड इन्वेस्टिंग इन आईटी आई वाज नॉट इन्वेस्टेड इन आईटी बिफोर दैट राइट सो आई थिंक इट्स अ ग्रेजुअल यू नो Uh, scale up that happens over a period of time, but I would I would just say this: when your portfolio size is small, the focus should be on how can you multiply your base capital, how can you grow it. वहाँ पे फिर sector और understanding का जो आपका है वो एक side में चलता रहेगा. And now there are so many fantastic platforms that have come up that gives you 
really end up understanding on the sectors and that really helps you to get a head start right so aapko ekdam scratch se sab kuch shuru karne ki zarurat nahi hai there are so many platforms that are available to do that for you uh so until a certain portfolio size is reached you can actually you know focus on momentum investing or positional investing or what sashank is uh, is doing in his case right so you can practice that on a certain portfolio size ek bar aa gaya uske baad mein over a period of time aapka industry ka sector understanding you thoda sa grow ho jata hai right so my only point is you really don't have to understand the particular sector that deeply to make money from market a certain understanding of aspects on momentum sentiment how market perception is uh, how the institutional investors are looking at that particular company what promoters are doing whether the earnings are there not ye sab enough hai you don't have to go deeper into the value chain and understand it and certain bit of connect within the investors community i think that's a pretty good combination what what do you say yeah i think i would i would completely agree with this and but you know uh, i would just add one more thing i should i think retail investors especially they should read very you know very aggressively uh and especially the books on you know past uh, you know traders or investors or you know different you know spaces the people who have actually made money from the market so you know i always recommend this book by you know jack swagger so he has written four five books on market wizards so that is one compendium of books that i would highly recommend people to read because you know what that gives you is it gives you a perspective of people who let's say 10 20 years or let's say 5 years back how they were thinking about markets so you know a lot of time you know since markets are all about pattern recognition by reading those investors you would kind of you know try to relate what's happening in the markets today so yeah i mean i, I would i would like you know to whatever amia said i would just add you know just like you know start reading uh, like you know widely about investors so these are jack swagger books are some of them that i would recommend i would recommend then books by john boyk so, so this guy wrote a book on called monster invest uh, monster stocks and he has written few other books where he speaks about the other uh, you know traders and investors who were uh you know uh, who who made like millions in different 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 decades so he has written books basically uh not by you know he he he, he let's say you know he picked up a 10 year you know time horizon and he would say that okay in this time horizon how many people made big money let me analyze these so what when what were they thinking so when you when you start reading these kind of books what happens is that you actually start getting a hang of what kind of person made what kind of money by which kind of stocks when economic or let's say global environment was like that like for example today's scenario of 2022 is quite resembling to the one of 1970s so you can just go back to that book and say that okay in 1970s what kind of people made money and where were they looking and they were looking at energy sector would be the you know the answer so what's happening right now what are the stocks that are making like you know a lot of money energy sector so when it, because the the thing that were common was that the fed was increasing rates in the 70s and same was happening right now so you know kind of a link of that so the idea for you guys should be that read voraciously and uh, try to connect the dots don't go like you know too much in the at least in the initial stage of uh, you know going overboard on particular strategy or something try try to get a hang of it and blend things so i would also recommend this book uh, called uh, the great depression diary by benjamin roth oh, a very a very good a book fantastic yeah. read yeah, yeah, yeah. amazing read it's scary yeah huh? and it's kind of a, absolutely scary and it it's kind of a counter to all the fomo and the euphoria that you may be तो अगर आपको ऐसा लग रहा है कि आप ओवर बुलिश हो रहे हो कभी ना मार्केट पे तो यू शुड गो एंड रीड दैट बुक और प्लीज यू शुड हैव दैट बुक इन योर कलेक्शन ऑल द टाइम बिकॉज़ यू नो कई बार हम ऐसा बोलते हैं ना आई कैन होल्ड दिस स्टॉक फॉर 10 इयर्स सो व्हाट आई कैन स्टार्ट बाइंग इट यू रीड दैट बुक एंड यू अंडरस्टैंड दैट व्हाट हैपेंस व्हेन द यू नो द स्लो ग्राइंड एक्चुअली स्टार्ट हैपनिंग व्हाट हैपेंस विद द हाउ हाउ इट ब्रेक्स डाउन द मेंटल यू नो द मेंटालिटी ऑफ द इन्वेस्टर वो 10 साल वाला इक्वेशन सर आउट ऑफ द विंडो चला जाता है उसके बाद में and then wo jo thought process hota hai yaar already itna gir chuka hai aur kitna girega 
right so that book is really really you know must have in your collection uh, that is one book and another is you know this another great book by jack swagger is a uh, hedge fund market with that i think shashank you only recommended it yeah, that is i mean i mean what a book what a book this one i mean because the the best part is they have picked up people from the hedge fund industry because generally hedge hedge funds mein kya hota hai ki ye i mean these are the people who look at multi strategies they will they will uh, you know trade bonds they will trade equities they will trade commodities they just want to create alpha so they i mean when you when you read interviews of these kind of people like who have given interviews like you know 10 like you know 5 uh, 10 years back you you would you would get a hang of what is going on in the markets and how to look at markets and where what kind of mistakes they made what they learned from it and how can like you know people after even after blowing up their accounts can make so much money so this last book that uh, unknown market wizards by jack swagger i think i tweeted some time back there you know people made uh there was a guy who, who like th- there's one guy who di- who does not follow fundamentals who does not follow technicals he trades on sentiments only sentiments and still make uh, you know tons of money and people over there like you know they ha- there was one guy who made 330% compounded for 27 years 27 years 330% compounded i mean if you are a if you are an institution investor or anything you you just can't do that only these these kind of things are only happen when you are retail investor small capital base so yeah i mean a lot a lot of books i mean uh, john train money masters of our time that is a that's a very good book and if you really want to understand how to manage your portfolio and your positions read this book all art of execution by lee freeman uh, and shor s h o r so that's a that's a good book on position sizing and how to also for uh, for traders specifically there is this great podcast i don't know whether how many of you follow but there is this trader swedish trader named christian kulamaki do you follow him shashank yeah christian uh, this kulamaki right yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah so yeah, there yeah. is great podcast that he has uh, chat with traders hmm. on breakouts home runs and exponential returns so This is also, you know, one of the great podcasts uh, to have in the. But I'll share the link, uh, the chat to this, uh, this space. Yeah, yeah, that's a. I mean, very, very good way to do it. See, uh, see, the bottom line is one simple thing: your portfolio should move. If your portfolio is not moving, you are loving your strategy or whatever. I mean, boss. At the end of the day, you know, the job is not done. It's like you know, operation successful, patient dead. Do, don't don't come to the markets for you know for the for the dopamine ke aaj kaun sa share chalega wo wo share kya lena ye bata do ji aaj don't don't come with that attitude come here to make money and you know once you have made money and everything tab baki sab cheeze sochna portfolio growth should be you know like of the primary objective right so there is one question uh, in the comments by uh, it's basically view on the defense sector and beaten down pharma space so pharma i think we already covered but again achil mahesh is asking shall we take call on sectors for example in frenzy in defense or contrarian bet uh, bet in beaten down sector today like pharma to see i mean uh, defense per se uh, i mean the sector does have tailwinds it all depends on you know government policies and everything so i i would i would say that you know uh, i would keep both in my uh, in my you know watch list uh defense after going up i i would like to see how it behaves now and what kind of a like you know time correction it goes through and if earnings and the stock price movement starts moving up i would be positive on that and how i look at pharma is i would i would look at pharma relatively more uh, you know like uh, Uh, keenly because there you can actually get big winners because the sector is in the downtrend so so you have certain kind of safety with uh, you know allocating capital so i would not buy immediately as of now but i would let's say you know uh, let's see which kind of stocks in the pharma sector you know because there's a this, this debate going on you know that whether the large cap pharma who are burning cash in the us with generics are they going to make money or not 
I mean, let's say you know, I, I'm on. I'm just saying that you know, that okay. Let's see how it shapes up, and we'll take calls accordingly. And like for example, Cipla and JB JB Chemicals and all, they're doing pretty good in the domestic markets and all. So yeah, I mean, uh, pharma as a sector could be a you know a place where big money can be made when the sector reverses. So it should be on the watch list. And the defense, you just see how much time correction the sector goes through and what kind of winners. keep getting the contracts from the from the government right so uh, the greatest uh, the great takeaway from sashank's talk is like we should never marry a stock right because we we often have a bias like we should make money by this stock only and when it comes to booking profit or maybe when it is in loss then also we keep on holding so as to come to Uh, every ponder consider so sashank any any sectors of flavor which you haven't talked now apart from say pharma you you think uh, where tailwinds or maybe sustainable tailwinds are there see immediately if i see if i just look at the past trends uh, in frying cement there are one sectors like you know generally going by data uh, before general elections like you know infra is one sector that generally does very well because of the you know the government uh, you know capex that happens on the infra infra side and the second thing is like you know infra picks up and because uh, the cement also has to do well along with it the cement prices if you see if you take up uh, let's say you know past few cycles 4 5 6 7 cycles so you would see that the cement prices start going up uh, one and a half to two years before elections so i think the range would be one and a half to to be on the safer side and the infra is one year so one year before election infra and one and a half years cement so cement and infra is one place that uh, that i personally see momentum to continue i mean again i can be wrong uh, apart from that uh, you know if you if you talk about structural trends uh, defense is one that comes to my mind and it is one it on the you know like i mean i put uh, like you know on the infrastructure building side because you know infrastructure without infrastructure building you can't really execute the you know the big tech ideas that the innovating you know, innovative companies are building on so that would be you know one area but for the revival for the structural uptrend pharma and uh, it services sector is one where i think people uh, should pay attention to and then you know there are also certain other small sectors like uh, insurance amcs uh, building materials so that are more linked with the you know the the growth of the economy as such so these are these are also you know few sectors that you know investors should 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 look at one thing uh, on the on the discretionary consumption on highly valued stocks that is one area that i'm like you know a bit skeptical of especially the paint sector Fair enough, fair enough. Yeah. So, Amir, any sectors to avoid, or maybe with your investing side? Not really, uh, Prince. To be very honest, uh, I think Sashank is better suited to answer that. <laughs> But uh, not, not in anything specific as such. I see. I follow a little different strategy when it comes to investing, and I tend to stay within the. Businesses which I really understand well, and sometimes what happens is, you know, on a short term, uh, if I don't understand where I really have to park my money or really where I want to park my money, I I tend to top up whatever I'm holding. So, not not always I go into the sectors which are highly discussed on social media. That is that is one thing for sure which I follow. So, but uh, maybe Sushant can answer that. Yeah, Shashank. Any any sectors which which you don't touch or maybe uh, don't like to play as far as your techno funda momentum investing is concerned? Well, I I have absolutely zero apprehensions on any sectors or anything. I'm here to make money. कहीं से भी बनवा दो. The the point is very simple. If the price see the only thing I I'm skeptical of is when the price is moving and the earnings are not coming. This is where I feel there is a pump and dump. Whether it is investors should be very careful of, and this is one area that I don't touch. 
like for example there is a recent uh, like you know a very good analysis by was presented i think uh, yesterday by this guy called shivaji vithal rao on the icici direct youtube channel so he was talking about how the you know cpsc sector can move and i and, and i'm pretty much uh, like you know inclined with his views so this is one sector uh, you know people should keep an eye on because uh, yeah i mean with certain kind of you know government capex and activity moving in so this sector can do well in 2023 so yeah i mean the only only space i you know don't touch is where uh, you know stocks are moving and earnings are not coming yeah fair enough so that was a one of a great interaction today shashank and amia it was really nice of you for agreeing to doing this and it it's almost to us and we feel like like the continuation is so so great and we are echoing with the thoughts have been shared over here so guys uh, i have a request to make kindly check out our handles and if you think we are uh, adding some kind of value to you please do give us a follow as a token of appreciation so that uh, that gives us the necessary motivation so as to bring more people to this forum and uh, ameya and shashank have been kind to me they have come to this forum time and again and uh, helping us with our queries and additionally like uh, <coughs> the, the session is recorded so if by any means you haven't heard the whole uh, session then you can uh, resort to the uh, recording of the session any any concluding remarks on your end amaya and shashank my thing is just because i mean you are here in the market paisa banao grow your portfolio keep you know calibrating your strategy know yourself read and do what works for you even if uh, we have shared some strategy some frameworks and everything there could be a case that it might not work for you please don't do it do the thing the way you want to do it everyone is personal every i mean investing is a very personal you know activity so build your framework where you find comfort but the end goal you should be that your portfolio should grow it should not your your strategy should not be at the expense of your portfolio growth that's it yeah Yeah, me. Ah, uh, now nothing specific to be very honest, and uh, all eyes on the coming up uh, quarterly earnings. Let's see. Uh, the only thing I would say is, you know, uh, not don't chase all these, you know, high P uh, multiple advanced technology companies too early, too soon, too much too soon. Uh, give it a time. Uh, Let's see how that plays out. Uh, try and like when so we talk about uh, infrastructure when it comes to the digital growth, right? So uh, don't tend to play the frontliners in that case. Uh, try to find out who are the proxies for you know data center infrastructure, data center proxies. So those companies would tend to do really well uh, because no matter whether it's a domestic data center that is being built or it's a It's built by any one of the large three hyperscalers. The domestic proxy companies are tend to benefit either ways. So that is one great pocket where you can keep your eyes on. Uh, and for a longer period of time, I think that digital engineering will will be you know what IT has been so far. So if you have missed out on all the secular growth that IT has given you over the past two decades, I think digital engineering is just starting out. Uh, we are very very early there on many many aspects. Uh, so just keep a watch on sector. Don't disregard any sector just because you know valuations are stretched. Of course, you need to learn to sell regardless how long your horizon is. Even if you say that I want to hold a stock for ten years, that does not mean you can't sell it in between and jump in again, right? So that is one thing which I have learned in past one year. No matter whether it's your four core portfolio stock. certain valuation it deserves a sale thank you thank you prince great message great message so basically we need to identify a personal niche and we should master some skill which work for us and there is nothing called uh, unreasonable expectation in the market be reasonable be less greedy and be more prepared when your theory matches with the market 
theory or maybe what you are thinking and the the thinking of the market matches that is the time when you b- make big money so with this uh, i i pass on the good comments coming from the attendees uh, shashank and amaya they are really appreciating this session and they have an additional uh, request to make basically the book names i think they can listen to the recording for that also and maybe if you guys can share with me i can put a thread or in case you want to put a thread we can also do that merry christmas to our eminent speakers and the attendees for today thank you so much friends and thanks to everyone yeah we can you know share the books yeah right otherwise. right and and like uh, shashank i have been getting numerous uh, requests like they were asking about the second part of the session we did last time so i think uh, we did some justice on that part uh, so the session is recording uh, recorded and those who missed it uh, last time they can uh, Uh, i mean listen about the framework and what is the thought process behind the techno funda momentum thing so thank you so much and uh, enjoy guys uh, take care we meet uh, again very soon thank you thank you thank you thank you bye bye